Did you know that there was a time when the Earth was covered by forests so dense that they modified its atmosphere? Each geological period has its own importance, specificities, and peculiarities. The Cambrian saw the birth of life and the first algae. The Ordovician saw the arrival of the first invertebrates, followed by the very first plants during the Silurian. We recently left the Devonian, having seen the first amphibians, tetrapodomorphs, the incredible radiation of fish, and the beginnings of the first forests. We still have a long way to go before reaching our century. Several milestones have marked the history of our planet and given it the shape it has today. The next stage in our understanding of our own and our planet's history is the Carboniferous. This era like all the others has its own characteristics, key stages that enable us to understand the world as it is today. How has the Earth evolved since the Devonian? What plant and land species now inhabit our planet? What are the milestones and major evolutions awaiting the flora and fauna of this Paleozoic era in particular? Dear Traveler, welcome. Today we're off to explore the mysterious Carboniferous period. But before we set off on a new adventure, remember to like the video and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss a thing. Thanks, and have a great trip! Left the Devonian, now we're at the gateway to the Carboniferous. We're still in the Paleozoic Era, also known as the Primary Era, a system that begins with a Cambrian and ends with a Permian. The Carboniferous period stretches from 359 to 299 million years ago, a total duration of 65 million years you can imagine how much the facets of the Earth and the biology of animals and plants have evolved in such a short space of time. And so we go from discovery to discovery. But let's get back to our time scale. The International Commission on Stratigraphy, which defines the geological scale, divides the Carboniferous into two subsystems, the Pennsylvanian, also known as the Silesian, and the Mississippian. Each of these Carboniferous subsystems is itself subdivided into three series, lower, middle, and upper. The Mississippian extends from around 359 million years ago to 323 million years ago. This is followed by the Pennsylvanian to the end of the Carboniferous, around 299 million years ago. Now that we've got the basics down, let's take a look at what our planet physically looks like. Geography evolves, as does climate. From a purely geographical point of view, changes in the face of the Earth are largely visible from the sky. Remember during the Devonian period we talked about the movement of land masses? There were two great continents, Laurasia to the north and Gondwana to the south, which collided at the end of the Devonian, giving rise to a supercontinent, Pangaea. This new supercontinent called Pangaea, which means one land, persisted until the Triassic, in the secondary era, some 60 million years later but the construction of this single land continued during the Carboniferous era, 
and here we can clearly see the movement of the continents. A seemingly infinite expanse, a single immense continent, and a vast ocean encircling it on all sides, Panthalassa. The link marking this unification, the suture, if you will, of these two giant blocks of land, Laurasia and Gondwana, is materialized by mountains. Here you can see the Hercynian chain. This is the eastern part of this mountainous line, but we can also see the Appalachian and Mauritanian ranges on the western side. They were formed through the collision of North America, belonging to Laurasia, with Northwest Africa, belonging to Gondwana. If you look closely at the position of these mountains and the place of the land masses, you'll see that these mountain ranges are mainly located at the equator. This means that this area enjoys a special climate, hot and humid. It is at their foot and in the interior basins that the swamp forests that were to become coal seems developed. These are known as coal-bearing forests. We'll have the opportunity to discover more on the subject later in our journey. What's important to remember here is the formation of Pangaea and the very active Orogeny during this period. Most of Pangaea is now assembled, with the exception of North China and Southeast Asia. The shape of Pangaea at the end of the Carboniferous is that of a closing sea, almost that of a D. This is a far cry from the position of the continents we know today. At the time, there were two major oceans, Panthalassa and Paleotethys, located within the sea formed by Pangaea. But minor oceans were also formed as the position of land masses evolved. These include the Prototethys, closed by the collision of the North China microcontinent in Siberia, the Rheic Ocean, closed by the collision of North and South America, or the shallow Ural Ocean, closed by the collision of Baltica and Siberia. This intense terrestrial activity has not only changed the face of our planet, it has also led to major climatic upheavals. The intense erosion that accompanied the formation of the Hercynian chain, coupled with lush vegetation, notably the famous Carboniferous coal forests, reduced the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. We'll take a closer look at how the coal forest the mountains and the fallen carbon dioxide are closely linked when we have a chance to explore the forest. For now, what we need to understand is that the climate changes during the Carboniferous period. Everything in nature is interconnected. You've seen this time and again in these videos and on our various trips. Falling CO2 levels inevitably have an impact on the planet. The Earth's temperature drops with multiple consequences. The climate becomes markedly different. It's not a real fracture, a drastic change, but there are significant changes nonetheless. The continental land masses of the South Pole, for example, are covered with ice. It was mainly during the second half of the Carboniferous period that the climate cooled again. Gondwana, in the high latitudes of the Southern Hemisphere, is now partly covered in ice. This glaciation continued into the Permian. Laurasia, on the other hand, was located at low latitudes and was not affected by this cooling. While temperatures are falling, particularly at the South Pole, since southern Gondwana is completely frozen over, other regions are characterized by higher humidity and warmer temperatures. 
In other words, there is a real demarcation between certain terrestrial regions. Until now, we haven't really had the opportunity to observe a zonation phenomenon like this on Earth. Another point to note before tackling the Carboniferous in greater depth, the ocean situation. Remember, in the Devonian we talked about the drop in sea level, which led to a major radiation of fish. At the beginning of the Carboniferous things were reversed. This time the sea rose and overflowed part of the continent. This is known as the Epicontinental Sea. This major transgression spread the warm waters of the Paleotethys over the continental shelves. For the underwater world, this phenomenon is a veritable springboard for life. Indeed, these warm waters will once again encourage the expansion and development of coral reefs, essential shelters for marine biodiversity. Last but not least, Rising water levels on the continent also mean the formation of swamps. Warmth, humidity, and rich soil are the winning combination for vegetation to thrive. This is what led to the exponential growth of vegetation during the Carboniferous period. Until now, the Earth has never known such a dense vegetation cover. This is one of the main events that defines this pivotal period for life on Earth. To give you an idea of what these swamp forests looked like, they are very similar to the forests of the Mississippi today. You're no doubt eager to learn more about these forests, and you'd like to understand what defines the famous coal-bearing forests of the Carboniferous period. But the call of the forest will have to wait a little longer. To understand this new world, we need to follow certain key stages, both in terms of evolution and land-based activities. Is it not through the rising waters that everything began for the forest? We've talked about forests, and you're probably thinking that life is teeming on the continent. But we're at the very beginning of the Carboniferous period, and you should know that it's not quite there yet. We've just come out of the Devonian and things are slowly coming back to life. Remember, during the Devonian period, life is indeed booming in the ocean. All this little world proliferates in the warm, luminous waters without thinking for a second that things are about to change radically. At the end of the Devonian, however, a great extinction struck the planet once again. The first had taken place in the Ordovician. Geological and climatic changes and other upheavals due to major terrestrial activity wiped out thousands of marine species. Contrary to popular belief, this extinction was progressive rather than brutal and radical. It took place over tens of thousands of years but the consequences are there for all to see. 75% of marine animals have disappeared. At that time, the Earth was occupied by a single continent located at the South Pole, while a string of islands and archipelagos stretched out at the equator. All the rest was just an immense ocean, On land, life was almost non-existent, apart from near the coast and in wetlands. A few insects and a few tetrapodomorphs tried their hand at life on land, but nothing had yet been gained for these first settlers. It has to be said that the environment at the end of the Devonian was still rather hostile, and conditions were not really ripe for the arrival of living creatures. At the gateway to the Carboniferous, the situation is still much the same. Life on land is still a long way off. Under the ocean, on the other hand, life is beginning to reassert itself and adapt to the various changes. As has been the case since our first voyages in the Cambrian, 
life is rich and abundant once again. Sponges, corals, brachiopods, nautiloids, and of course fish of all kinds enjoy this new underwater haven. Let's take a look at a typical Carboniferous seascape. What plant and animal species inhabit this underwater setting? First of all, as you now know, the epic continental sea that formed in the Carboniferous favored the creation of a new biotope. The waters here are shallow, 200 meters or 700 feet at most. But this region of the ocean benefits from the sun's luminosity and warmth. Corals quickly establish themselves here. Everything is in place to encourage their growth. Whether solitary or colonial, they build extensive reefs in the warm waters of the Paleothis. These in turn encourage the expansion of other species. Brachiopods such as this Productus greatly appreciate this marine region. It lives and feeds on the seabed. The small spines that can be seen in the dorsal valve are not a defensive weapon against predators. For that, the shell is the only protection it has. The spines, on the other hand, are useful for holding on tightly to the bottom. In brachiopods, these spines can be more or less prominent depending on whether the substrate is muddy or hard. The genus Productus was quite diverse in the Carboniferous. Here we see a Productus giganteus, here a Productus subaculeatus, and over there a Productus cora, or a Productus punctatus. The giganteus is undoubtedly the most exceptional of these. Scientists believe it to be the largest brachiopoda ever to have lived on our planet. It could reach 30 to 35 centimeters, or 13 inches. Like the other members of its group, it naturally occupies the seabed, preferring shallow, muddy waters. Aside from this preferred location, this brachiopod adapts to all regions. It can be found in Europe, Asia, and North Africa. Buried in sand or mud, its imposing size, weight, and sturdy spines give it great stability in the water. Waves do not prevent it from remaining firmly attached to its substrate. Unable to move, this sessile animal has a diet adapted to its own physical limitations. It feeds by filtration to extract suspended phytoplankton. For this reason, it settles in shallow waters that take full advantage of the sun's rays. Its favorite food, phytoplankton, thrives here. To extract these planktonic particles, it uses an organ called a lophophore. The lophophore surrounds the mouth. It's a highly efficient system, a real collector of suspended particles. The lophophore is made up of tentacles and can take on a variety of shapes – ring shape, horseshoe shape, or coiled. It's hollow and silated, so it can catch particles. One problem with being fixed is reproduction. In Gigantia, scientists believe that gametes are released into the water column. Other suspension-feeding sessile animals are the blastoids, notably the yellow blastoid, such as Orificrinus, and the crinoids, such as the red crinoid. Let's start with the blastoids. These are part of the so-called echinoderms. The echinoderm is characterized by a body protected by a set of interlocking, firmly welded limestone plates. These plates form what is known as a theca, a hard, mineralized, very solid envelope. 
In these animals, the mouth is in the center. But all around it, like petals around a flower pistil, are mouth depressions. These have two important roles to play. Firstly, they support the filtering organs called brachioles. Secondly, they also contain the animal's respiratory pores. This is not the only echinoderm present here. Another member of this group evolves very close to our blastoid. Do you notice it? It has a very distinct shape and blends in so well with the scenery that you could walk right past it without thinking for a second that it's an animal. In fact, it looks more like a plant. But if you get a little closer, you'll see that it's actually a marine animal with an articulated limestone skeleton. It also has a kind of root to anchor itself to the ground and a calyx with long, flexible arms to filter the plankton it feeds on from the water. Or should we say, feed on in the plural, since they rarely live in isolation from one another. Have these precious clues put you on the right track? This famous echinoderm, the king of camouflage, is a crinoid, and more precisely, Right in front of us is a red crinoid. The filtration system of crinoids is quite different from that of blastoids. They filter seawater by fanning out their arms. They then transport the plankton to their mouths by means of tiny cilia covering the arms. These cilia are called pinules. Depending on the species, the arms can measure up to 50 centimeters or 20 inches long. Here we can estimate a length of 30 centimeters or 12 inches. Unlike other parts of its body, the crinoid's pinules are soft. They are the only part of the body without a calcified skeleton to ensure flexibility of movement and therefore perfect optimization of filtration. And as if that weren't enough, to be sure of winning every time, these pinules secrete a sticky glue. A formidable plankton magnet, this ability enables it to find food in abundance in this sunny part of the ocean. But in the sea, there are still a multitude of animals of all shapes and sizes to be discovered. Take this mollusk, for example. It's a cephalopod, to be precise. You may remember that this genus, the Gonionites, diversified greatly during the Devonian. This continued into the Carboniferous. In fact, this is the period when they developed and diversified the most. Gonionites are marine animals with shells. Their shells are highly distinctive. Unlike others, they have several chambers within the shell, separated by zigzag-shaped sutures. If you look closely, you can see that one of these chambers is larger than the others. This is where the cephalopod lives. But the other chambers, while not used as living quarters, do have their uses. Each of them, filled with gas, plays a hydrostatic role. Thanks to this physical property, Gonionites can swim in open water and maintain a pressure balance as required. They are said to be nectonic. Unlike plankton, nekton can swim, even against the current. On the other hand, they are far from being able to compete with fish. They are not equipped for fast swimming, nor are they renowned for any particular skill. But that doesn't seem to bother him in the least. He is adapted to his condition and sets off in search of food. Sight is his guide. The cephalopod has two rather well-developed eyes. It also has tentacles, no doubt useful for feeding. This, at least, is the hypothesis put forward by paleobiologists. In fact, despite the few fossils in the possession of museums, Scientists are faced with an unanswered question 
when it comes to the lifestyle and diet of Ghanaianites. There are no sufficiently convincing clues that these animals had a benthic lifestyle, for example. There is very little evidence to support a reliable hypothesis about the diet of Ghanaianites. The only thing we can be sure of is that they lacked the calcified, beaked jaws of some of their relatives. We can therefore rule out hard-shelled and shell-bearing animals from their diet. While many marine species take advantage of these shallow waters to diversify, some are in decline. The number of marine arthropods has fallen drastically. This is particularly true of trilobites. But some are luckier than others. Some arthropods, for the time being at least, endure despite the difficulties facing the genus. This is a megarachne, a eurypterid, Aquatic or semi-aquatic, we don't really know. It measures nearly 60 centimeters or 24 inches when its legs are extended. But we'll meet it a little later in the trip. Not far away, a little deeper, we should be able to spot other marine species. As we were saying, marine animals come in all shapes and sizes. As you can see, the corals are home to quite different species from what we've seen so far. This time, no shells, no calcified skeletons either, but fins. Look, here we are in front of a shoal of Uranothus. They seem to enjoy swimming in the midst of these days of yellow blastoids and red crinoids undulating in the current. Unfortunately for these fish, they'll have to postpone their nautical activities and think about protecting themselves quickly from the approaching predator. The mastodon you see now is a member of the Stethacanthus genus. If we have doubts about the diet of the Ghanaianites, we know pretty well the diet of the predator that will follow, Acmonistion zangrelli. Stethacanthus is an extinct genus of primitive Holocephalus. It is one of the first cartilaginous fish to have lived on our planet, along with Cladocelicae and Gladbacchus. This makes it one of the oldest sharks on the planet. But this prestigious title doesn't seem to dampen his ardor. He's on the hunt. Stethacanthus is a predator that thrives in both fresh and salt water, where we also find ourselves. Measuring up to two meters or seven feet for the largest, it is quite similar to our contemporary sharks. Its name means anvil shark. As you can imagine, this name is inspired by its distinctive morphology. You can clearly see the anvil-shaped fin on its back. However, this is not the case for females. Only the males display this prominence. Why did males have this distinctive dorsal fin? There are two possibilities. The first suggests that it was used to attract the attention of females. The second suggests that it was an advantage for males when they had to fight each other to establish their position and conquer a female. This primitive shark lived in shallow waters, mainly coastal areas. It feeds on crustaceans and mollusks, but also on fish. Contrary to popular belief, not all cartilaginous animals are sharks, nor are they all large fish. To understand this, let's go a little deeper into the ocean. The fish we're about to meet are particularly fond of the deep sea. Here we can observe a school of Falcatus, another Holocephalus. It has very large eyes. Do you know why? It's very dark here. We're no longer in the photic part of the ocean. 
These big eyes are very useful for seeing clearly in such darkness. It also has a homocercal tail fin. The caudal fin is located at the rear end of the fish. There are four forms of caudal fin. The homocercal form means that it is symmetrical with two equal lobes. The caudal fin is remarkably well developed in Falcatus. In other words, he must have been an outstanding swimmer. The shrimps that move here and there will undoubtedly serve as his breakfast. He loves these little creatures. Before leaving, did you notice anything else peculiar about him? The thorn. You're probably wondering what that thorn on his back is for. Is it really just for shrimping? No, it's something else. Like our previous shark, Falcatus also has a very distinctive sexual dimorphism. Only males have this dorsal fin, with a sort of spine projecting forward. Now it's time to head back up to the light. It's nice to be back in a more familiar landscape, illuminated by the sun's rays breaking through the surface. We see corals, algae, echinoderms, blastoids, and many other small marine animals. Suddenly, the ocean is much more welcoming and reassuring. A few mollusks, crustaceans, and a variety of small fish wander through this thriving ecosystem. But small prey galore also means predators on the prowl. One of them is approaching and the weaker ones are already panicking. They're right to be scared. There are big marine predators in the Carboniferous. Here it comes. This one belongs to the genus Chondrichthians, i.e. cartilaginous fishes, and to the group of elasmobranchs that include sharks, rays, and sawfish in the order Selachy. Unlike sharks, it does not belong to the Selachy order, but to the Tenacanthiform, which means dragon shark. Sharks and dragon sharks have much in common, including five to seven pairs of gill slits opening individually outwards, rigid dorsal fins, and small, placoid scales on the skin. The major difference between the two lies in the dorsal fins. These are made up of spines. The spines on the fins of Dracopristus, the specimen in front of us, were very large, measuring just over 55 centimeters or 22 inches long, i.e. around 25% of the total body length. Lurking at the bottom of the water, Dracopristus had to watch its back and protect itself from danger. Semi-buried in the ground, it can easily be attacked by a more powerful and imposing predator, such as Glycmanius occidentalis. Thanks to its famous prominent spines, it can counter attacks. The surprise effect when the predator rubs against the thorn in its mouth, can give Dracopristus a few seconds to react. Dentition and mouth opening also present some distinctions between Selachy and Tenacanthiform, or if you prefer to call them that, between sharks and dragon sharks. Let's take the dentition of Dracopristus as a control for our comparative study. Its teeth are adapted to seize and crush its prey. The dentition consists of a long blade-like tooth surrounded by numerous short fork-like teeth. It has 12 rows of teeth. Its teeth are designed to catch food and swallow it whole. There's no room for chance. The victim has very little chance of escaping alive. Sharks also have several rows of teeth, but they have a different shape 
and there aren't several small teeth around a large blade as here. The opening of this lethal weapon is also larger, in tenacanthiform, i.e. in Dracopristus, than in sharks. On the other hand, it is less flexible. Many sharks inhabit the ocean. We've already seen several types, as well as closely related creatures. Sharks appeared much earlier in the Ordovician period, but they never managed to make their mark against other predators. The Carboniferous period is known as the Golden Age of Sharks. It was their extinction at the end of the Devonian period that allowed them to become the kings of the ocean. The extinction, so to speak, cleaned up the big predators. A vacant spot in the ocean was quickly filled by the shark group they were then able to dominate the marine waters and give birth to a whole variety of forms as they diversified. While all the species we've seen so far live underwater, others haven't managed to choose between land and sea. Amphibians, or at least some of them, seem to enjoy both environments without distinction. It's with them that we'll be making our transition from aquatic to terrestrial life. We'll be taking our first steps on land, but for some time to come, we'll be avoiding going deeper into the continent. It's too early to survive in these distant lands. The forest hasn't hatched yet. It's dormant. It's getting ready. In the meantime, let's continue our journey along the coast and through the swamps. How did amphibians come to divide themselves between two worlds? By the end of the Devonian period, we had witnessed a major radiation of fish. Several hypotheses have been put forward as to the causes of these changes and evolutions. For them, answering the call of the continent had become inevitable for a number of reasons. Scientists point to two main plausible causes. To protect themselves from new predators, notably sharks, and to get around in waterways where the water level is very low and the tangle of branches and roots greatly hinders movement. Don't forget that the forest is gradually but surely taking root. For the moment, it can only do so in wetlands. This is a good thing for life on the mainland, but it does make things difficult for some fish. To get out of this predicament, these swimmers are starting to develop legs. Of course, at first, they're more like pseudopterons, but the machine has been set in motion. Without this evolution, there would probably be no amphibians, reptiles, birds, or even mammals on Earth. The appearance of legs brought with it a veritable revolution in the animals that would soon populate our planet. Alongside legs, the ability to breathe out of water was also discussed. Without this ability, walking on land would have been utopian, Sarcopterygians, bony fish with a swim bladder, a lung in short, are going to divert this organ from its original purpose. Initially dedicated to maintaining equilibrium in the water, lungs can now also be used to breathe the oxygen contained in the air. Nevertheless, these animals of a different kind still need the aquatic environment to live. Exclusive terrestrial life has not yet been fully conquered. The question of reproduction and the fragility of the egg, for example, is one of the reasons why exclusive terrestrial life is impossible. That's where we left off in our investigations at this stage in the evolutionary process of fish and pre-amphibians at the end of the Devonian Let's resume our study of this conquest of the land 
with the now much more developed amphibians of the Carboniferous. The amphibians of this period are known as stegocephali, meaning head with plates. We're going to have to find them. Their morphology is quite remarkable, but they also know how to blend into the background. Let's start with a rather terrestrial animal, which we're sure will be easier to flush out. This is Balanerpton woody. It feeds on insects. We should be able to find them in the vegetation cover near this stream. Well, here's one. It's barely 20 centimeters or eight inches long, but you can clearly see its long body, legs, and head. It's precisely at the back of its head that it has a large tympanic opening. This means that its hearing is well developed even in the open air. Unlike some specimens found at the end of the Devonian period, our Balanerpton has very strong bones. He's quite capable of supporting his weight and his movements out of the water. He looks like a salamander. His head, rather round and flat, but also his posture, give him this apparent resemblance. It has around 40 teeth on its upper jaw and 20 on its lower, making it an accomplished carnivore. Insects are its favorite diet. It was one of the first temnospondyls. This group has long withstood the many changes on our planet and even certain biological crises. It survived until the Cretaceous period when it was present on Earth for almost 220 million years. They lived much longer than the dinosaurs, for example, which are often used as a benchmark for comparing longevity. Let's continue our exploration. We're approaching a swamp. Unlike the first, this one has no legs. It lost them as it evolved. This may seem totally implausible to you, but tetrapods have repeatedly lost and regained their limbs over the course of biological evolution. Life knows how to adapt when necessary. Tetrapods are no exception. But let's get back to the swamp and the animal we're concerned with. It's an Ophiderpeton. It looks more like a snake and is quite long close to 70 centimeters or 28 inches when fully grown. Now that you've got his picture in your head, you shouldn't miss him. Yes, it's really him. Afi Derpeton, Brown Rigi. It has no fewer than 230 vertebrae. His large forward-facing eyes guide his hunt. He hides in the hollow of a burrow and comes out when hunger strikes. Insects, worms, millipedes, anything of reasonable size will fit in its mouth. Other amphibians also live in the area, but you have to leave the marshy area and approach the lake to catch a glimpse of them. You'll see that this body of fresh water is also teeming with life. This is Microbrachus. He too looks like a salamander. However, it has a total of 40 vertebrae and short limbs. This skeleton is not conducive to swimming. It does, however, manage with a body undulation system. It's not fast, but the technique is effective. In addition to the salamander, Microbrachus also closely resembles the axolotl. Do you notice the little membranes on the sides of its head? These are the remains of its larval gills. He keeps them as an adult. A little further on, we can see Amphibamus grandiceps. This time, at first glance, it's clear that it belongs to the amphibian group. The body is stockier and the head more triangular. 
It measures around 20 centimeters or 8 inches. When you look at its skeleton, it's easy to see how it can move. Its legs and long clawed toes help it to move on the ground. In the water, it's the tail that stands out. It's shaped like an oar and becomes a precious asset for getting around in open water. So it has two possible means of locomotion. He juggles between one and the other according to his needs. I'd like you to ask yourself about these two possibilities. Why live both in the water and on land? They have legs and lungs, so why don't they conquer the ground out of wetlands, lakes, rivers, and swamps? Every animal ability in nature has an origin, a raison d'etre. If these animals preserve their aquatic and terrestrial abilities, it's for a good reason. The survival of a species depends on more than the availability of food. Without food, there is no energy. Without energy, the body withers and dies. But the survival of a species also depends on its ability to reproduce. It must be able to reproduce under the right conditions and multiply births so that the younger generation replaces the older. But for these animals, nothing is simple at the moment. Without the aquatic environment, embryos cannot survive. Another major revolution is now underway to counter this problem facing nature, the amniotic egg. To understand this revolution, we need to take a closer look at the amniotic egg. Here's a Hylanomus laeli, quite similar to our present-day lizards and one of the very first amniotes. The amnion is a protective envelope. Inside is the embryo, of course, but also the amniotic fluid. In other words, it's as if the liquid environment has invited itself into the egg. The embryo is protected in this precious liquid. It can develop without fear. The amnion protects the embryo liquid unit. External pressure and desiccation are no longer an obstacle to the birth of life on Earth. An egg can finally survive on dry land. Beings like Hylanomus laeli can now move away from wetlands and into the forest. Their bodies have also adapted to this new way of life. Look at the skin. It no longer looks as moist or even vicious as the previous amphibians we met. It's drier. It's also tighter, making it easier to fight dehydration. In other words, when Hylanomus approaches a watering hole, it's only to drink when it's thirsty, but not for breeding purposes. Hylanomus wasn't the only amniote to live in the Carboniferous. Petrolocosaurus is also widely present. It's an important encounter because according to some scientists, it's one of the oldest diopsids known. It may even have given rise to crocodiles, dinosaurs, and since birds are descended from it, even birds. In fact, diapsids are a clade of amniote tetrapods from the sauropsid clade, which includes all present-day birds and reptiles. One of the great particularities of diapsids is that their skulls have two pairs of temporal fossae, i.e. two openings. The squamosal and postorbital bones separate them. These openings allow the jaws to lock in a closed position, giving them greater strength when bitten. It fed on small forest insects. This little lizard-like animal ran faster than other species, especially on the ground. And lucky for him, 
Despite being only 40 centimeters or 16 inches long, it was the prey of giants, such as Megarachne, and its 35 centimeter or 14 inch diameter. Meganeura and its 70 centimeter or 28 inch wingspan, or in a completely different genre, giant amphibians such as Proterogerinus. Let's close our tour of the land of amniotes with a synapsid. This is Archaeotherus, the oldest known synapsid, along with the Kynerpeton. According to some paleobiologists, it is probably the distant ancestor of mammals. Archaeotherus had strong jaws that could open wider than those of early reptiles. While its sharp teeth were all the same shape, it also had a pair of canines that were more enlarged than the other teeth. He lives here, at the edge of this Lipidodendron forest. Speaking of forests, I think it's time we learn more about this new plant cover, don't you? Judging by the landscape in which this Archaeotherus is growing, it seems to have developed quite well. While we were roaming the ocean and taking our first steps on the coast, a lot was happening on the continent. At the dawn of the Carboniferous, the forest was in its infancy. Now it covers a large part of the continent. It is a new ecosystem in its own right, providing food and shelter for many species of animals of all shapes and sizes. Our Archaeotherus, for example, has found everything it needs to survive here. Before we go a little deeper into the coal forest, let's take a look at it from the air. Look at how the vegetation cover grows a little more every millennium and how beautiful it is now. A luxuriant, rich, and varied forest is born. It didn't all happen in a day, of course. Time played its most beautiful part, following the order of things to create perfect harmony. Initially, the vegetation took root near water sources and wetlands. At that point, plant reproduction still required very specific characteristics. Without a wetland, the conquest of plants would have been, at least at their current stage of evolution, totally impossible. We'll see why. Other plants before them, such as Cooksonia, had prepared the ground. They managed to get away with it, growing in a wide band along coastlines and waterways. Their tilling of the soil then encourages the birth of other plants which in turn develop and spread a little further over these wetlands. It's as if a virtuous circle is taking shape before our very eyes. But terrestrial vegetation doesn't just happen. Each has its own place and its own characteristics. We can now speak of a forest for its richness and diversity. In the water, we can see plants, such as calamites. At the water's edge, we can also see a sphenophyllum. A few meters from the shore, species such as chordates, seed ferns, and sigillaria complete the picture. Deeper down, arborescent species dominate the landscape. Despite the medium-sized ferns, Ceronius, and Lepidodendron can also be seen. Chordate and Sigillaria are also visible further inland. This pattern may vary from region to region, 
But whatever the location, the forest observes a certain pre-established order in which each plant has its place. As mentioned above, the Earth's climate, and therefore biotope, is clearly demarcated by distance from the equator. The significant variation in temperature between the poles of the equator leads to a zonation of vegetation. Large coal-bearing forests of Lipidodendron, Sigillaria, Calamites, and Chordates develop at the equator, while forests of trees, such as Glossopteris, thrive in temperate zones. It's time to go deeper into the forest to understand the different challenges of this plant cover, but also to understand how plants have managed to adapt in order to grow, develop, and diversify. Let's start by looking at how they reproduce. This analysis will give us a better understanding of how vegetation has been able to conquer larger territories. Why did most plant species end up in wetlands? There's a very good reason. Their mode of reproduction required it. Initially, species develop in patches. This is explained by a mode of reproduction based on cell cloning. This development is typical of organisms whose capacity to exploit the environment is limited, as they do not yet have any real roots other than for light capture. In other words, cloning was the only way for them to reproduce quickly and efficiently, given the conditions available to them. But this mode of reproduction also has its limits. If it's useful on poor, hard soil, it's less so for conquering a larger territory. Then spores made their grand entrance. From then on, reproduction became easier but certain elements had to be present for it to work. A mild climate is not enough. Humidity is necessary for germination. Spores are released by the plant, then germinate to form male or female plantlets, known as gametophytes. It is these gametophytes that produce the sex cells to make a new plant, the gametophytes must come together so that their sex cells can meet. And in the vast majority of cases, water serves as the conduit for this rapprochement. Lipidodendrons, Sigillaria, Calamites, and Pecopterus use this reproductive model to extend their territory. So, to go where the water isn't, we need to take another look at our mode of reproduction and be inventive, a mode in which the germination cell is protected, a mode where sex cells can meet without the intervention of water. This is precisely when the seed appears. The seed results from the fertilization of a female sex cell by a male sex cell. A fruit then hatches housing the seeds. These contain all the plant's genetics. The Terra dospermales take advantage of this new way of developing the species. They are seed ferns. This is also the case with the Cordiatalis, they had both male and female branches. The ovules aided by the wind could then receive the pollen grains and form a fruit in which the seeds nestled. These seeds can even lie dormant, waiting for the right moment to begin the germination process. A major advantage for reproduction in unfavorable climatic conditions this is how new plants were able to conquer the Earth's soil, and how vast forests came into being. Some of these forests are known as coal forests. Even so, 
Most of them were made up of spore-bearing plants, as the humid environment lent itself to this. These included Lipidodendrons, Sigillaria, Calamites, and even tree ferns. But there were also some seed-bearing plants, like the Cordatales we've just seen, the first conifers, if you will, and seed-bearing ferns called Pteridospermales. Now let's see why we speak of coal forests. How is coal formed? The production process is highly specific. The Carboniferous was the geological period when production was most intense. It was one of the events that marked this period and earned it its name. Since then, no production has been equaled in terms of intensity. For this coal to form, three elements are required. A dense forest, of course, but not just anywhere. It has to be close to the mountains and its feet in the water, in the heart of a marshy area. It's when all these elements come together, and only when they come together, that a particular phenomenon is triggered. When a lush, dense forest forms in a wetland between mountains, there comes a time when the ground sinks. The forest is drowned, so to speak. It gradually dies. Plant debris begins to accumulate slowly, but it doesn't decompose. Putrefaction is only possible if the fungi that cause it are present. According to scientists, this is not yet the case at this stage of life on Earth. You're probably wondering why I insisted on the presence of mountains. I'm getting to that. Sediment from the erosion of nearby mountains covers this plant debris. Depending on the region and the very makeup of the mountain range, the type of sediment may be different. In the case of clay, shale is formed. If it's sand, then sandstone will form later. The subsided and flooded area is then filled with these materials. A new cycle can begin. A new forest is formed. When it reaches its peak, the ground subsides. The forest is drowned and dies. Sediments cover the flooded area and the plant debris. They fossilize and charcoal forms. Then a new forest springs up, and so on. Each destroyed forest becomes a new coal seam. In some coal mining areas, there are hundreds of layers of fossilized forest. But this doesn't mean that the cycle is a quick one, taking just a handful of years. Coal is transformed very slowly. It takes millions of years to produce coal, and it takes on different forms, or rather, a different constitution, as it transforms before it can be called hard coal. We generally speak of coals and coal-bearing forests when referring to coal production. But this is misleading. Coal is a generic term, and hard coal is just one specific quality of coal. To better understand, let's look at the production of this phenomenon. The decomposition of plants in a low oxygen, fungus-free environment during the Carboniferous period first takes the form of peat. Peat is the incomplete decomposition of plants in a water-saturated zone. In other words, it is a fossil organic material. It contains relatively little carbon, around 60%. After a few million years, peat becomes lignite. This is the first stage of fossil plant coal. It is brown and compact. It's the first stage of coal, but also the least qualitative, at least in terms of combustible energy. As coal transforms, its carbon content increases. Next comes hard coal 
a fossilized vegetable coal with an even higher carbon content than lignite. It is also black in color, but brighter. After hard coal comes anthracite. This time the carbon content approaches 94%. It is so concentrated that it is difficult to ignite. The final stage is graphite. This is pure crystallized carbon. It is no longer flammable. So man is looking for the best quality coal with a sufficiently high carbon content, but still easily flammable to make a perfect fuel. Hard coal is the preferred fuel, and it's this interest in man that has made him the talk of the town but before man came along and sought to harness this combustible energy, the carboniferous coal-making process had an impact on the climate. The burial of so much organic carbon caused a dizzying drop in the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. This drop in CO2 not only cools the climate, but also increases oxygen levels Oxygen levels will have an impact on the development of insects, but we'll come back to that later. The erosion of high mountains increases. They are subject to heavy rainfall due to their geographical position, and they too draw in carbon dioxide. The combination of these phenomena, leading to a sharp drop in carbon dioxide, is conducive to the formation of an ice cap. Remember, we touched on this subject when we talked about the changing climate during the Carboniferous period. This ice cap formed mainly in southern Gondwana around 330 million years ago. This was the start of the Gondwanic glaciation, which continued through the Permian. You'll understand better now why we talk about coal forests, but also why they played a role in the cooling of certain areas of the planet. Now it's time to understand another tree-related phenomenon. We mentioned seeds earlier, but that's not the only revolution in trees. Let's see how deciduous leaves came about. The opulence of the vegetation colonizing the continent has the main effect of considerably lowering CO2 levels in the air, and by the same token, the planet's overall temperature. We've seen this regularly on our various time travels. An ecosystem is based on a delicate balance between a biotope, fauna, flora, climate and environment. All these elements are interconnected, and each is ultimately dependent on the others. A change in temperature inevitably has an impact on all these elements, flora and fauna included. Such a major change can make some species more vulnerable, but it can also have a number of positive consequences. In temperate zones, for example, temperature differences will favor the development of deciduous trees. Trees need to adopt new aptitudes to continue colonizing the soil. They need to make better use of the sun's energy, save energy to survive temperature variations, and develop a more durable means of reproduction. Deciduous leaves thus make their grand entrance among arborescent plants, while the great coal forests stretch all the way to the equator. Leaves are not only less necessary for trees, they can also endanger them. Large quantities of water evaporate through the leaves every day. In temperate zones, certain climatic changes could lead to the loss of the tree. The trunk and branches are insulated by the bark, and the roots buried in the ground are sufficiently armed against this drop in temperature. But the leaves? They're on the front line and very greedy for water. To resist, the tree learns to get rid of the superfluous. Not only deciduous leaves, 
but also different modes of reproduction, allow trees to grow widely across the continent. The newly formed forests were home to a wide variety of fauna. The first amniotes or reptiles, animals such as Echinopeton, Archaeotherus, or Hylonomus lyelli, live in the forest, but they share it with insects. Contrary to popular belief, these animals are not always the predators. In fact, they sometimes side with the giant insect's prey. As the forest grows and becomes so luxuriant and varied, insects benefit greatly from this new ecosystem. One of the great characteristics of the Carboniferous period was its giant insects. It's true that for our current way of thinking, to imagine for a single second that a millipede or dragonfly is close to a meter long seems totally implausible and even downright frightening. We're used to dealing with insects that are much smaller, sometimes even tiny or microscopic. Yet the Carboniferous is renowned for being the reign of giant insects. However, here again it's important to keep things in perspective if we want to get as close to reality as possible. While it's true that some Carboniferous insects were monstrously large, not all of them were. It's not a generality, an absolute rule among insects of this period. Many of them were just as small as we might imagine today. With that out of the way, let's dig a little deeper to understand the reasons for the unusual proportions of this particular animal group. Many scientists have tried to understand the causes of gigantism in these species. Why did they adopt such proportions? Several hypotheses have been put forward on the subject, but most of them are based on the significant increase in oxygen levels in the atmosphere. We have seen that the fall of the coal forests and the formation of coal led to a drop in carbon dioxide, but also to a sharp rise in oxygen levels. Michael S. Engel, a paleontologist specializing in insects, at the University of Kansas explains that insects don't have lungs, but rather small external orifices. These orifices, called stigmas, allow air to enter their bodies. It circulates through a network of tubes, the tracheae, to supply the organs with oxygen. This form of passive respiration is not very efficient as oxygen diffusion is slower than if it were carried by the blood, as in vertebrates. The only way for giant arthropods to have enough oxygen to survive with such a respiratory system is for the air reaching their tracheae to be more oxygenated. This was the case in the Carboniferous, when the rate was 35% instead of 21% today. Insects trapped in amber are one of the means by which scientists have been able to determine this oxygen content. A number of experiments have been carried out to test this line of thought. Researchers led by Arizona State University paleobiologist John Vandenbrooks have grown very large dragonflies rearing the insects from start to finish in environments similar to Earth's oxygen conditions millions of years ago. They turned out to be 15% larger than normal. To correlate these results, they also collected 11 other living fossils, such as beetles and cockroaches, 
in three habitats with different oxygen concentrations. Some had 31% as in the Carboniferous, others 21% as today, and still others 12% as 240 million years ago. They discovered that dragonflies and beetles grew faster and larger in an oxygen-rich environment, while cockroaches grew more slowly and remained the same size. They also observed that all but two species of bugs became smaller than normal at lower oxygen concentrations. This probably explains why not all the insects were oversized at the time. With their respiratory systems, they adapt to the amount of oxygen they can take in. Coming back to insects in general, whether gigantic or ordinary sized, it's hard to say today how many different species populated the Earth. Indeed, we have no precise idea of the current number. To date, around a million different species have been described, but it is estimated that there are probably 10 to 100 times that number, many of them found in the canopies of the great tropical forests, notably the Amazon rainforest. So there is still a lot we don't know, even today. In the Carboniferous, we know of certain species, but there is certainly a great deal that is unknown even then. Let's take a look at some of these giants. To inaugurate our encounter with Carboniferous insects, let's start with one of the most emblematic of the era, Meganeura monie. This is the most famous giant dragonfly of the period. With a wingspan of over 70 centimeters or 28 inches, it weighed 150 grams. In other words, such an insect on your forearm would have the same wingspan as a hawk. Its abdomen, as you can see, is very elongated. It also has four large ribbed wings attached to its thorax. Its six jointed legs are covered with spines, no doubt to help it hang on to its victims. Dragonflies are predators, and this one is a fearsomely efficient one. Its eyesight is a major asset. It has a 360 degree view. Nothing escapes it. But it's not enough to have a good view of your victim. You also need to be reactive and powerful in order to seize it and give it no chance of regaining its freedom. Reactivity is provided by its wings and legs. Unlike our modern dragonflies, which do this while hovering, this one was able to attack in flight. Scientists have studied the fossil and hypothesized that it could reach a top speed of 70 kilometers per hour or 44 miles per hour. The power, however, lies in the head. Its mouth parts are designed for biting. She was never a picky eater, making do with whatever came her way. Cockroaches, bedbugs, cicadas, beetles, mosquitoes, wasps, termites, ants. Its diet was as varied as insect biodiversity could be in these lush carboniferous forests. Here is a 20 centimeter or eight inch cockroach that should make a perfect breakfast for our majestic Meganeura. In the same vein, but smaller, with a wingspan of 55 centimeters or 22 inches, we can also mention the Mazotheros, Haliodictyopteran. This one has three pairs of wings. Another animal, this time wingless, is as iconic of the period as Meganeura. It's a centipede, Arthropleura. 
450 million years ago, centipedes, i.e. myriapods, a sub-branch of the arthropods and cousin of insects, began to emerge from the water. They were probably the first animals to settle permanently on continents, but they were probably not at first as impressive as the one that now awaits us. Over 2.5 meters, or 8 feet long, and around 50 centimeters, or 20 inches wide. And that's just the beginning. This centipede was as long as an alligator. Arthropleura's diet still poses questions for the scientific community. Traces of pollen were found in its abdomen, suggesting a herbivorous diet but it also had two pincers and a very powerful jaw. Such tools suggest a carnivorous diet. Let's take a look at Megarachne, a spider. At least aesthetically, it looks like one, even if recent studies have shown that scientists classify the animal as a Eurypterid. This misclassification was based on certain characteristics, such as the shape of its carapace, the arrangement of its mouth parts, its circular belly, and its 15 millimeter circular eyes, located between the other two eyes in the middle of its head. At first glance, this suggested that Megarachne was a spider, and not just any spider, the largest ever to have lived on Earth. Since then, the tools and techniques used to study fossils, as well as our knowledge of the past, have enabled us to analyze these animals from a different, more precise angle. Although this is certainly a Eurypterid, its deceptive appearance has earned it the right to appear here, simply for the pleasure and fright that such an animal provides. With a length of 35 centimeters or 14 inches and a distance of 60 centimeters or 24 inches between the upper legs, it is without doubt the most impressive of all arachnids. With such proportions, it could cover a cat. In addition to its size, its predatory prowess is nothing to be ashamed of. She's perfectly equipped for the hunt and will stop at nothing when the opportunity presents itself. The only relief is that Megarachne is no longer with us. Crossing paths with this type of animal is enough to make your hair stand on end and make you scream in horror. Let's end our tour of Carboniferous Arthropods and Insects on a softer note, with the discovery in 2021 of Tenoptilus frequens. The Paris Natural History Museum has funded and coordinated a paleology research group. It was this study that brought Tenoptilus frequens to light. It has an abdominal appendage for depositing eggs. These animals are known as ovipositors. They also have three pairs of sword-shaped valves and two valve articulation systems. In other words, they have all the characteristics of Orthoptera. Analyses have enabled us to study the fossilized animal's abdomen in greater depth. We're talking here about a lobated insect, i.e. of the locust, grasshopper, or cricket genus. These animals were already living on Earth in the Carboniferous period. The major difference between today's insect population and that of the past lies in the insect's growth phase. Back then, very few were part of the so-called metamorphosis insects, such as flies, bees, and beetles. Vegetation is one of the keys to this animal diversification. 
Alongside the classic ferns with sporangia-bearing leaves, there are ferns whose leaves bear seeds for the very first time. After the appearance of amniotic eggs, the seed enters the scene. So it seems that plants too are undergoing major revolutions. Numerous species, insects, but also synapsids, diapsids, and amphibians are taking advantage of this new, flourishing ecosystem and all the riches it has to offer. The expansion of all these species should not, however, obscure the change that is taking place in the forest at the end of the Carboniferous period. Indeed, with the end of coal formation comes the end of the Carboniferous, from which the period takes its name. One possible explanation for the end of charcoal production lies in the appearance of a new species of lignivorous or xylophagous fungi capable of degrading all lignin thanks to enzymes known as lignin peroxidasis. Their appearance ushered in a new era, the Permian. It too will have to meet certain challenges, but we'll see about that on our next trip. <laughs>